Good morning, I'm Cody Henriksen. Today we're going to be looking at Java 2D arrays and how they're set up and using them. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at is with the idea of the structure of a 2D array. Really what it is is just organizing our data into a 2D grid of information. Basically a table of stuff going from top left to bottom right. Um, what we really need to understand though about Java, the way it deals with the 2D array, is the 2D array is really just an array of arrays. Each row in the array itself is another array. What we do in Java by convention is that we list the rows first, then the columns in the first set of square brackets. So we'll have the name of the array, number of rows, number of columns specified right there. Um, again, also with arrays that are a little special with this, there's no actual keyword for them. So the keyword for it is two sets of square brackets in a row. As you can see right here, we have the type, the set of square brackets belong for the multi-dimensional set of arrays. In this case, it's a 2D grid, so it has two sets of square brackets. If we're doing a three-dimensional space, we'd have three square brackets. And then the variable name, followed by a semicolon, of course, because it's their great friend. We have a sample right here of an int and a monster array. So we have the idea of a primitive as well as an object. So we can see how to actually declare those objects right there. We'll go into a bit more detail as we go through and look at that. But again, the same basic structure is the name of the, excuse me. Again, the basic structure is the type of object that we're going to be storing inside the 2D grid. The two sets of square brackets that define the fact that it is a 2D array, followed by its variable name, and of course, our great friend, the semicolon. As you look right here, we can actually see the structure for that 2D grid. Notice right here, if we move the cursor over this, that we have row zero, column zero up here in the top left. And in the bottom, we have row four, column four. So this would be declared as an array of five, five, because there are five rows and five columns specified in this. Notice also that in row zero, we have column zero, column one, two, three, four. And for column zero, we have rows one, two, three, and four. And again, the way this is set up is that each row right here, in this case, this row, this row, one, zero, two, three, or four, all of these rows are themselves an array. So we have an actual array of structures stored right here inside that first spot. The second row is another array, columns zero through four, stored inside this location. So the first array, column zero, row, all the rows, is actually an array holder. So this row right here is a set of arrays. This is one array that has five, five indices. This is also another array with five indices, zero through four. Row two, also an array, five indices. Row three, five indices. Row four, five indices. However, the converse is not true. The column right here is not an array with this is a spot, this is a spot, this is a spot, this is a spot. No, what we have right here is this is the first location in that first array. This is the first location in the second array. This is the first location in the third array. This is the first location in the fourth array. And this is the first location in the fifth array. So the columns themselves are not themselves a set of array or a set of arrays. Only the rows are a set of arrays. So row zero is an array. Row one is an array. Column zero, column one are merely all those values in all the different arrays that we're working with. As you can see right here, we have the idea that they grow up 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way down for all of those, and 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way across for all of the columns. So when we look at the idea of our array, again, just like we just saw, we start counting at zero, just like when any other array or list we've been working with before. And so spot zero all the way up to spot length minus one is what we're gonna see inside each of our rows. Um, the Iranian.length gives us the number of rows. So if I go back to that previous slide right here, as you can see, we did dot .length, we'd get five right here because we have zero, one, two, three, four, because that's the length minus one for that four, so the total number of rows in that would be five. To get the number of columns, we use the array name sub zero dot .length. And so for any rectangular array, we go to what row zero, because that's all of them are gonna have the same day, <clears throat> Since we're using a rectangular array, AKA, we're gonna have always the same number of rows and always the same number of columns, regardless of what that same number happens to be, whether it's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, 1008. We're always gonna have the same number all the way down when we're dealing with a rectangular data structure. And in that case right here, so I go to row zero, I call its dot length. So I'm gonna go zero, one, two, three, four. Oh, I have four, thi four um, things, so it's a total length of five. So my idea on that, the size of my columns is gonna be sub zero dot length. So sub zero dot length, column number is four, so five total columns inside that structure. Again, 
we always add one to that last value to get the idea of the number of length on that, as we've always been doing. Nice way to remember that is the use of the sub zero dot length. So we have the nice little image of sub zero. It's kind of cool, it's cold, cold it's columns, sub zero. And so sub zero dot length gives us the number of columns inside our data structure. When we look at the idea of initializing an array, but it's always gonna be filled with the default values just like a regular array itself. That means all objects will be instantiated with a null position, a zero for all number based primitives and false for our Boolean primitives. So when we first create an array, we have to remember that there's going to be nothing really useful inside it. Here we have the creation of a 2D array of objects. We declared variables for rows and columns, set 10 and 7. We said monster array scaring monster. And scaring monster is a new monster array, passing it the rows and columns. Again, notice the fact that we do not have a constructor over here. We are merely specifying that we have the 2D array marker right here, saying it's a 2D array of the type monster. And then we call the constructor. We're creating a new monster 2D array, passing it the rows and columns values. That's what's going. Again, notice there are no parentheses right here. We're not using a regular constructor call because arrays are special. And right here, we're gonna say scary monster sub nine sub six. We're gonna go for the last row and the last column. Again, putting rows first, then columns. This is often called row major order. And we're gonna say that that last spot is a new monster object. So in the very bottom right corner, we're gonna have a monster inside that. All of our other values, from rows zero up to nine and columns zero up to six, except for this last location of nine, six, are all gonna be full of null. So we have the idea that when we create our object, there's gonna be nothing inside it, except when we specifically initialize a default value, or sorry, except when we specifically initialize a value for a specific location, in this case, nine, six, or sub nine, sub six, inside our data structure. We have the same thing right here with our primitives. We have an int 2D array called number grid. That number grid is a new int array. This one's gonna be a five by five number grid like we just saw back on the screen. Number grid at spot zero or sub zero sub one will be assigned the value of 42. And then int temporary value is gonna be assigned the value of what's at number grid sub zero sub zero. And because we haven't done anything else in this point, that sub zero sub zero will have a value of zero because it's a default value for an int. And so temporary value will have the value of zero. Number grid sub zero sub one will have the value of 42. Again, with iteration, we have to have something in mind with this. Iteration is a really big deal. It's one of the most, thing, most common things we will do with the 2D array, but we can't just loop over the 2D array. We have to actually break the 2D around to its two component pieces, the rows and columns. And the 2D array has two basic indices we'll be dealing with, the row and column indices. If we're using a regular for loop, we can loop over either one of those first because we have the value of the position, we have that index value we can actually iterate over. We can go up or down, left or right, whatever we want to do. We just have to choose one of those indices, row or column, and iterate over that first for the outer loop. The inner loop will then have also a nested for loop inside that, use the other index using the other associated value. If we're using rows, we'll do dot length. If we're using columns, we do sub zero dot length. And we can change directions, go back and forth. We have the manipulative power of the int that we're using as our iteration index. So we can go any way we want with that. However, when we're using a for each loop, we are a little bit more limited when it comes to iterating over a 2D structure. In a for each loop, we have to iterate over the rows because each row itself is an array. So I'll iterate over all the rows first. And then inside the array, which is the row, we'll iterate over each value inside that because we don't have access to which column we're looking at, rather the value that's stored at that spot in the array. And so we'll take a look at that here in just a second. As you can see right here, we have the regular for loop. Int row is equal to zero. We then go over on the iteration test. We go to row is less than number grid dot length. I'm just littering over rows right now. And my row is gonna go up by one. For my inner nested loop, notice that I'm going to my call is set for zero. Call is going not over dot length, but rather sub zero dot length using the idea of that sub zero again, because we're using a rectangular array. And this will give us the number of columns. Dot length gives us the number of rows, but we're gonna go over columns right here. We're using the sub zero dot length. And I'm using just a quick little system print statement. So the value of row plus row, column plus column is, and then the name of the 2D array, followed by sub row, sub call. That gives us access to the value stored in this 2D array at that location of row, comma, column. So we have the row, column, at address, and that's gonna grab that value from it and put it inside that. So when we're using a for loop as a nested structure, iterate over that, we always wanna make sure we choose the correct test against this because we want to make sure we avoid errors. So in this case of row, we go to dot length. In the case of column, we go to sub zero dot length. Always keep that in mind, row and column have different tests to go against. 
we can't guarantee that it's always going to be a square array. We can always assume that it's going to be a rectangular array here in class. When we're using a for each loop, it's a little bit different. Now, if you notice right here, the for each loop, the first for each loop, for int array row colon number grid. So I'm going to iterate over each row inside that data structure of number grid. So I'm using the idea right here of that. I'm grabbing the row out of that. And then for each value in that row, for that second inner for each loop, I'm iterating over the values in that row. I now have no reference at all to where I'm at inside that number grid at all. I don't know which row I'm at. I don't know what column I'm at. But rather, what I have is the value that's specified in that value of the row. And so then I have my lovely little print statement, very helpful, where I don't know where I am, but my value is plus value. Because this value variable we have right here is the actual value that's stored right now inside that row. We are not dealing with indices at all using a for each loop on a 2D array. We only have access to the values stored inside that. And so that's a really key part you want to make sure you know or remember is that when we're dealing with a for each loop, we can iterate first over all the rows. And then once we're in the row, in our nested for each loop, we then have access to the values inside that row. It's a very key concept we have to make sure we keep in mind. Now, again, arrays are still hipster. 2D arrays are also hipster as well, so there are no methods that belong just to the array class. There are no constructors or friends anywhere in sight. A single data member, dot length, refers to the number of rows. If we want to access the number of columns, we go to the dot length of the zeroth row, in this case, sub zero dot length, and grab that value of number of columns for the 2D array.